Hello, and welcome to the Week 14 Awards Market Show. Today, we'll be discussing the current betting odds for MVP, Coach of the Year, Offensive Player of the Year, and more. As many of you know, this is my favorite market. Awards markets are my favorite markets to bet on. I find it fascinating to build a portfolio. MVP this year, though, uh, Ryan, I mean... (laughs) I took way too much. I just, you don't want to have too many guys. You don't want to have too much money in one market, especially when it's 10 to one or 20 to one or lower because you just can't win that much. And so things got away from me in the MVP market and I have way too many tickets on way too many guys yet. It's going to be impossible for me to make a real profit. I I do want to start with the Tyree kill stuff. I tweeted something about MVP uh, on Monday or Tuesday and got a ton of response. The overwhelming amount of responses were, why is it not Tyreek Hill? And I can sit here all day and make arguments for why a wide receiver should not be the most valuable player in the NFL. But what I think does not matter at all, and I kind of think that as we get towards the end here, it's not just about who's in play, who's played well. We know all that by now. It's what the voters think. And there is going to be a lot of pressure, I think, on voters to vote for Tyreek here because you can poke holes in every single quarterback that is above Tyreek. So DraftKings has 16 to one here. There was an off market 25 to one at Circa on Tyreek Hill. I didn't want to add more to MVP, but I have this like feeling that, and I'm going to get to some of the holes that you can poke in a second here, but I got this feeling that there is so much public pressure that I'm seeing that Tyreek Hill should be MVP, that voters who are a lot of them are just public people that, you know, would reply on Twitter anyways. They might think that Tyreek Hill is actually the MVP. So we've been through this a thousand times, Ryan. We tell people you should never not be betting on non-quarterbacks. I think I still agree with that, but this year shaping was really unique. So how bad do you think the Tyreek Hill stuff is right now? I don't actually think it's bad at all. And I think there's even a semi-recent precedent for it. I forget the exact year, but Adrian Peterson won the MVP. He's the last non-quarterback to win. The Vikings went 10-6 and six that year. He went over 2,000 yards. The truth is, if if Hill goes over 2,000 yards, sets the single, single season receiving record, and the Dolphins are, you know, the number, the number two or three seed in the AFC, I do think there's an argument. Cooper Cup got a vote a couple years ago, so I think that's a parallel here too. It's just, can one of these quarterbacks do enough down the stretch to make it where he can't win. Ah, uh, you muted, Adam. The reason that I think it is a unique year is because no quarterback is running away with it. Here on DraftKings, the favorite is Brock Purdy. There are a ton of people out there, smart people, dumb people, whatever, who think Brock Purdy is not the MVP because any quarterback will be doing this with the 49ers. I disagree, but that narrative is out there. Jalen Hurts, people say, oh, well, He's only doing this because of the tush push. He hasn't even had that great of a year. Dak Prescott, his team may not even win the division. I mean, you know, and how can you give a guy the MVP whose team hasn't won the division? Tua is of largely a function of Tyreek. That's what people want to say. Mahomes and the Chiefs have been flat bad. Lamar is one that I want to talk about that I think is interesting. So if I can poke holes in all those guys and Tyreek sets the single season record, for receiving yards. That's how I think voters can get into their head that this is the year that it should be a non quarterback. Gary, what do you think about all this Tyreek for MVP stuff? And what do you think about, because that the off market stuff is not going to be there for most people. So I don't think I'd take the 16s and the 17s, but I do think the 25s are okay. So yeah. What do you think about Tyreek? Yeah, I largely agree with what both of you have been saying here. Um, and I definitely don't disagree that this should this is the year that, as of right now, before we are kicking off week 14, it seems plausible. I'll paint the other side for a second of why I don't think it's going to happen. Um, and it's not just because we still have like three or four quarterbacks that are making a case. Um, twofold. One, like I, I just think we still have, what, five weeks left. There's a really good chance that somebody goes 14 and two or, or 14 and three or 13 and four or whatever. And whether it's Purdy or if Dak wins on Sunday night, et cetera, um, that will separate themselves. The other, the other point I want to make, and you hit it on the top is we're trying to get into these voters heads, right? That's really what this all comes down to. And I don't want to get too controversial or anything like that. Um, but I think there's two reasons why Tyreek Hill might not get the votes for, 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 uh, 
from all the voters enough to at least win the award. One, because he's not a quarterback. I think there's plenty of traditionalists out there that would do that. And two, you don't have to dive that far into his history to know that this guy isn't the best guy off the field historically. And I think that there's probably enough moral conscious people out there. Offensive player of the year, you can live with that. He deserves it. Stats say that. To, to grant this guy the MVP, I think I really do think there's enough. If I'm just trying to get to these guys' heads, mm -hmm. there's enough people out there that would say that's a tiebreaker. I'm not giving that guy my MVP vote. There's plenty of people that say this is the best player in the league. He deserves it in numbers. They'll give him the vote. But I don't know if he has enough between those two things for me to take it seriously. The reason, and I think that's a very fair point, but the reason that I wouldn't take the 16s and the 17s on Tyreek is the rest of season schedule. Titans this week should be a shred. But then Jets, Cowboys, Ravens over the next three weeks are three of the toughest matchups Tyreek and Tua will have all year. If he wins in those matchups, though, my God, he's going to look even better. But yeah, I mean, Jets, Cowboys, Ravens, very difficult down the stretch. Again, I think if you can find a 20, 22, 25, I, I would be okay with that on Tyreek, given everything we said. There's more to talk about on MVP, though, beyond the Tyreek stuff. Dak and Hertz are playing each other this week, Ryan. There's a lot of people out there who say, whoever you think is going to win, don't bet the game. Just bet the MVP because you can get longer odds on whoever thinks going to win the game. I don't, I hate getting into spots where you say that because you could easily lose both, right? Like you could easily have, you know, Hertz win the game and not win MVP. And then you lost your winning bet on the Eagles or whatever. But anyways, what do you think about this Dak Hertz matchup and how much that affects how you're going to play MVP between those two? Uh, yeah, I agree with you, especially with, you know, four or five games left. There's there's too much too much can go wrong between now and then for this to be a, you know, if they were both like 12 to one, maybe, but at four to one, three to one, I, I wouldn't treat that way either. But one of them is going to go to the top of this race, the winner, most likely, especially if Dak shreds the Eagles in the air again, because, you know, right now he's first in touchdowns. He's second in EPA per play, second in QBR, second in rating. So statistically, he's all right there. Him and Purdy are all right there. So. Dallas wins this game, and, you know, interestingly enough, they went from three-point favorites to three-and-a-half early in the week. I was very surprised it got past the key number of three, but, mm -hmm. you know, well, I do think whoever ends up winning that game this week ends up being on top of the MVP race market yeah. next Monday. I mean, if you if you think Dallas wins the game, and like Ryan said, they're three-and-a-half-point favorites, I think Dak is, if Dallas wins, Dak is going to have a huge game because they are going to be very throw-happy. That's what everyone does against the Eagles, and that's what the Cowboys have been doing. The Purdy discussion, Gary, is an interesting one. Purdy's currently the favorite, probably won't be after this week. I do think that the 49ers have a really good chance of finishing with the best record in the league. Although I should note on Hurts that Jalen Hurts' last three games are against Giants, Cardinals, Giants. So it's really likely that Hurts comes down the stretch with a bunch of wins. But if Brock Purdy is the NFC's number one seed, He's the guy like he is to me going to go in as the favorite. I'm just not sure he will get the votes. There is an overwhelming narrative out there among a lot of people that Brock Purdy is not the reason this team is so good. So I definitely would not take the three to one on Purdy right now. No, nowhere near it. I don't know. It's a question of how you think the voters feel about Purdy. Gary, any thoughts on Purdy leading the race right now? Yeah. I mean, I, I totally get that narrative. You know, you can you can paint the picture. Well, this has this is probably the most talented team on the league on both sides of the ball. He a product of the system. Like you could paint that whole narrative. But then if you go look and look look at the stats, like it's not it's not like he's just straight up managing game managing his way there, right? We're we're coming off a game, and yeah, everyone's been gashing Philly, but uh, through the air. But we're coming off a three hundred yard four touchdown game. He's had a couple, you know, if, to use DraftKings analogies, like a couple games sitting around thirty DraftKings points. Like that's serious stuff. Um, I think what you need, what needs to happen for Purdy to stay in that top two mix or stay atop the race is for them to basically win out or make sure they're the number one seed. And then for him to have pretty much every other game, like right around that 300 plus yards, three plus touchdowns. And then I think you will be in a position where your, you know, those counter arguments kind of start to dissipate because sure. you win, you win so much, your stats are there as well. Um, and at that point I think it's, it's fair, but I think that is a little bit of a parlay to hit, right. um, because I do think that the way that they went often could be from defensive scores, could be from so much on the back of Christian McCaffrey, that I think at the end of the day, when you take a look at the stats of Dak or Hertz, whichever one wins on Sunday or, or wherever we may end up in four or five weeks, it's going to be a little bit too hard to overcome. So I totally agree with you at these three to ones. I wouldn't be taking Purdy, but I could see the path where 
you know, we're sitting here in a month and he's still the favorite. Sure. And to be clear on 49ers schedule, and again, I think for Purdy to win, they have to win all these games versus Seahawks at Cardinals versus Ravens at Commanders versus Rams. Very capable of winning all five of those games. But in order for Purdy to do that, in order for them, in order for Purdy to win, they would have to do that. And like Gary said, I think that's a pretty big parlay. The last guy that I wanted to mention, Ryan, is Lamar Jackson. You can get him nine to one now. And I mean, there are a lot of holes in all these guys. I know Lamar's stats have dipped a little bit, but he can get it ramped up in a hurry here. Schedule is Rams, Jaguars, 49ers, Dolphins, Steelers. I wanted to highlight that Christmas night, 1225, Christmas night, Ravens at 49ers. Everyone is going to be watching that game. If Lamar can win a bunch of these games and put a bunch of numbers, and then on Christmas, beat Brock Purdy in San Francisco and have a good game. To me, Lamar is going to be right there. He's nine to one on DraftKings right now. Might be a little bit better elsewhere. Any thoughts on Lamar there, Ryan, or anyone else you want to mention in the MVP race? Yeah, for Lamar, uh, I think your thought process is, is exactly right. Um, he's a little bit off production-wise to this point. In fact, I'd say the Ravens offense has probably disappointed me a little bit more than has everyone else, but you're 100% right. Late season swings happen all the time in awards markets. 49ers, Ravens is you know a pretend, potential Super Bowl preview. Like you said, everyone's going to be watching it. If Lamar catches up productivity-wise, where this is actually kind of a big game against the Rams this week because if it's windy, that's off the table a little bit. But if it's clean, he could light them up some. So he could he could crawl back into the race from that point. And then, like you said, if he beats the 49ers, they're in business. I have two, two long shots that I just want to discuss. I'm not sure I'm betting on either of them, but I want to discuss them. Josh Allen right now, second in TDs. He's third in QPR. He's fourth in EPR, EPA per game, or per play, rather, and ninth in rating. And the thing is, if Buffalo gets into the playoffs, he's going to have to go scorched earth. And since there isn't really a traditional winner right now, I do think if he goes absolutely nuts, it's going to be hard to ignore him. And the other one is, since Trevor Lawrence is going to miss some time, the Texans could actually win the division now. And I don't think C.J. Stroud, he's, he's a little bit far off the pace productivity-wise, but I think he's the most live right now that he has been the whole year. Yeah. But I, I do think Allen's someone worth considering, especially if you think they're going to beat the Chiefs this week. So I think a lot of voters will have a big problem voting for a rookie quarterback. They're going to vote for him for offensive rookie of the year. I, I don't think that they're going to vote for Stroud for MVP, but I think it's an interesting thought. I'd probably need longer than 30 to one. The Josh Allen one is interesting, man. And that's one of the ways that MVP got away from me personally this year. I would kept taking Josh Allen 15, yeah. 18, 20, 25. And now that looks somewhat dead. He's 40 to one on DraftKings. I think the bills have run so bad in outcome. Like they are way better than their record seems, but I'm just not sure that voters will understand that. And they'll say, Oh, these guys squeaked into the playoffs. How can Josh Allen be the MVP of a team that squeaked into the playoffs? Right? So there's a reason they're long shots. You're not going to get 40, 30 to one stuff this late in the year in MVP without it being a very narrow path. But yeah, I think those are at least worth discussing. Gary, any other MVP thoughts before we move on? No, I mean, I was going to bring up Stroud too. And, and my only uh, addition to that point is schedule the rest of the way for Houston. You get the Titans twice, the Colts, the Jets. I think all four of those are winnable games. And then the Browns are the other one. I mean, you're looking at three and two or four and one there, I think. Uh, possibly trip to the the winning the division. Um, and again, maybe you want to play that more into the D'Amico Ryan stuff. We'll talk about when we get the coach of the year. But uh, I, I do think it's live. Uh, you know, I, you probably need some of these other guys to fall more on their face. And maybe there is that mental hurdle, hurdle for voters like you brought up, Adam. But I think he's I still think he's interesting in a year where no one wants to grab this award. Now, I actually think he might actually deserve it. Like without CJ Stroud, yeah. this team might win three games, like yeah. four games or something, you know? So I don't think it's crazy to think he deserves it. I just, yeah, I'm pretty skeptical that they'll be voting for him. All right. This might be our longest segment in the history of this show on MVP. <laughs> Let's move to offensive player of the year. So here is where it starts to get tricky. A voter that votes Tyreek Hill MVP. I don't think we'll also vote for him for offensive player of the year. I, I don't know. This is like kind of unprecedented because I've just been so adamant that voters are going to vote for quarterback no matter what. Currently, Tyreek Hill minus 175 to be offensive player of the year. CMC plus 135. Everyone else is way far back. So I guess my point is that if you think Tyreek Hill is going, has a chance to be MVP, it's less likely He's offensive player of the year. Another way to play it is you could take Tyreek Hill 
MVP and Offensive Player of the Year, and it maybe expect to hit both of those. But man, that seems like not a great idea to me at minus 175. So Ryan, how do you think voters are thinking about the Tyreek thing with OPOY and anything else on OPOY? I mean, this race reminds me of Cooper Cup versus Jonathan Taylor a couple of years ago. Those guys were neck and neck as soon as Derrick Henry went down in like week eight. These guys have pulled away completely. Feel kind of bad for CeeDee Lamb and A.J. Brown. They'd be right in the right in the thick of things if Tyreek Hill wasn't having a, you know, a, a historic season. But I do I would give the edge to the wide receiver if he keeps this up. Like you said before, though, he has a tough schedule down the stretch. So yeah, I, I still lean his way. My one caveat I'll give here is if Brock Purdy doesn't win the MVP and the 49ers finish 13 and four, they do probably want to give a 49er an award. So I think that's one of McCaffrey's paths to overtaking Hill if Hill slows down a bit. Yeah, I think along the same lines as why voters may try to excuse themselves around Brock Purdy for MVP, they could just be like, well, Christian McCaffrey is a product of, uh, you know, the best offense in the league and Kyle Shanahan and, and all this. Tyreek feels like he's just out there doing it himself yeah. like he it just watching the games it just feels like no one can stop him he makes these insane long plays so regularly that no one else in the league can do so yeah i, I feel if people don't vote tyreek mvp i feel really confident that if the voting was right now they would vote tyreek offensive player of the year gary any thoughts on this opoy race yeah, so I think if Tyreek doesn't get MVP, I think this is his award to lose at this point. Um, and I, I feel very confident that he's getting it. I did just have a, a thought pop into my head, though, right? So say he goes scorched earth in this tough schedule, like forces voters' hands to, and, and no quarterback takes away with it, forces, forces voters' hands to make him the MVP. Um, we we talk about the reason quarterbacks don't win MVP sometimes because of their record or whatever. Is Josh Allen even listed here? Like if Tyreek Hill won MVP, and Josh Allen just also goes scorch earth, but the Bills barely sneak in or just sneak into the playoffs, but has like insane numbers, but people can't vote him MVP because of their record. Like, I don't know. That's kind of interesting to me. Yeah, 150 to yeah. one right now on Josh Allen. I mean, you don't have to be right very often for a bet at 150 to one to be good. Um, yeah, any thoughts on that, Ryan? I think it's interesting. I, like, I took some Bills when they were down bad last week. I took some Bills long shot. AFC Championship, Super Bowl exacta stuff, but maybe this is a better way to think about it. I don't know. What do you think about Josh Allen, OPOY, Ryan? I like it. I actually think it's a great call, especially because in the past, you know, this is kind of like a fluctuating reward. Sometimes quarterbacks win. Lately, it's been skill position players. So this would be a way if Josh Allen just goes nuts down the stretch and they finish 10 and 7 and get in, that they could reward him for that. So as soon as this show's done, gentlemen, I'm tailing Gary on that one. <laughs> uh, massive game for that this week. I think if the Bills lose to the Chiefs on Sunday, like it's over for Josh Allen, right? right? There's no way he can win this. He has to beat the Chiefs on Sunday. Chiefs are a one and a half point favorite there in Kansas City. Anything else on OPOY? Not for me. All right. No. Defensive player of the year. So there is a large faction of people out there who believe Dallas has the best defense in the league. And Dallas' defense has been very dominant against weak opponents. They have not been as good against good opponents. However, I just think the narrative that's out there that Dallas is the best defense in the league and Micah Parsons is the face of that defense, deservedly the favorite in this race, plus 125. Miles Garrett's plus 225. TJ Watt plus 310. Seems really thin after that. I did take that long shot Josh Allen, like 70 to 1 like a month ago we talked about or something like that. He's down to 20 to one, but still doesn't feel great for him to win it. Ryan, how do you think about this defensive player of the year race? Do you still consider it a three-man race between Parsons, Garrett, and TJ Watt? I think I'll call it five men, four and a half men, Adam, because if Trevor Lawrence is out multiple weeks, I think Josh Allen's basically dead. And, you know, in general, I'm kind of the king of betting on a defensive player of the year for 100 to one and them getting close and not winning. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the path he's on right now here. Speaking of those kind of guys, Xavier and Howard and Trayvon Diggs a couple years ago both had double digit interceptions, were finalists, you know, top three guys got, got votes, but they didn't win. I do think Darren Bland should be closer to six to one than 15 to one because the guy has five touchdowns and that's ridiculous. And that does, that has factored in in the past. I know it did with Stefan Gilmore. That said, I do think this is more of a, I don't think people are watching defensive film, you know, throughout the season. I think this is more of like a, you know, a headliner award. 
and the top three guys are headliners, and Parsons plays for the better team, the national brand, and he is the face of the defense. So I bet on him before the season. He's been in the lead for a reason, even though he's been behind the sack base. Yes, shout out Penn State. By the way, I, I can't believe this, but I think I saw Trevor Lawrence is practicing today in, in some yeah. capacity. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, the Maybe guy literally the, couldn't, uh, he couldn't walk Mahomes, three days ago, but. The Mahomes Super Bowl uh, injection or whatever <laughs> for the yeah. high ankle. Uh, I mean, yeah. it'd be, I, to me, that's that's foolish because you want to you want to conserve him for the playoffs and the, the down, down the stretch. But hey, I saw that too. I was shocked. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I don't feel good about any bets here because right. I do think that Parsons, barring injury down the stretch here, is really likely to win. I don't think I would take Garrett or Watt at these really short prices. But Gary, any thoughts on DPOI? No, I think we kind of missed our window to take any of these longer shots or, or grab Garrett or Watt when they were a little bit longer. Um, I do think on the first episode, I called this like maybe Michael Parsons might walk to this award. And I, and I definitely regret saying that. I mean, I probably undershot Garrett and TJ Watt for how strong of players that they are just to force themselves into this race. It just, I remember we did that first show after like four weeks and Michael Parsons was just off to such a hot start and he's still the favorite. So credit to him. But I do think this is really close between those, those three. And, and also I think Bland's an interesting uh, long shot as, as uh, Ryan had said, but I don't, I still don't even know if that's long enough for me to, to go there. All right. I thought the best bet that I had this offseason was Bijan Robinson plus 500 to be offensive rookie of the year. That ticket is officially up in flames now because CJ Stroud has locked up the award. He is minus 20,000 uh, to be uh, the offensive rookie of the year. I'm pretty sure, Ryan, if you're betting anyone else here, just torching money. But yeah, I, I think it's like, even if he got hurt this week, do you think Stroud would still win the award? I kind of think that he might. I think he might too. And the only reason why he might not is because Puka Nakua is kind of going crazy. That's the only reason why, how, why someone could catch him in that scenario where, again, that's really the only, like if he gets hurt, for, hurts against, hurt against the Jets, that's the only path that he has any shot of losing at all. Yeah. Okay. I don't think we need to spend any time on that. Let's go to defensive rookie of the year. So I haven't played in this market a lot this year. I don't have any Jalen Carter. He's minus 200. I took some Witherspoon early in the year at like plus 350 or something like that after that Giants game. Nothing's really changed. He's plus 300. Will Anderson has made a bit of a move. He's up to plus 400 for defensive rookie of the year. But I would say this is not a market that um, I've been in much this year. Ryan, any thoughts on where we sit now? Jalen Carter, again, minus 200, the overwhelming favorite. Yeah, no one's really ran away with this one, but like you said, Will Anderson's moved up. I've, I've viewed this as a three-player race for, you know, probably two months now. And the thing I'll say is, like you said before with Hurts, Carts plays Carter plays the Giants twice and the Cardinals once, so he could he could steam late. The Seahawks are going to probably be in desperation mode. They could be six and eight at the end of next week. They play 49ers this week. I believe they play Philly next week, so they're going to have to do some things down the stretch. And then with Anderson, the thing that I like about him is he gets the Titans twice late. You know, bad offensive lines. They get the Jets this week, so it's too late to bet on them. But if you got him at ten or twelve to one when we were talking about him a few weeks ago, I think you have to be pretty happy about your position right now. Uh, Gary, any defensive rookie of the year uh, thoughts here? Yeah, not really. Um, probably the the market I'm least familiar with in general. It seems like Carter would be rewarded, assuming the Eagles win the division, and he just continues to be an every down force. But you know, I, t I kind of agree with the Will Anderson thing. You mentioned the, the schedule down the stretch is somewhat interesting. If he could just like rake up a bunch of sacks as he, you know, kind of gets more accustomed to NFL life here. I agree. You probably missed your boats, like really get in. But if you had some conviction at four to one, I mean, you know, I think there's been worse bets made before. Yeah, I think get Ryan's point on Eagle schedule down the stretch. I mean, Tommy DeVito sack rate is completely ridiculous. <laughs> the Cardinals take a ton of sacks also. And so Jalen Carter racking up like, a bunch of TFLs and sacks over the last three weeks of the season, I think is going to go a long way for him. Coach of the year. Dan Campbell and D'Amico Ryans have been like on top of this race for much of the year. And I think deservedly so. Both of them have done a really good job. Uh, talked about Dan Campbell ad nauseum. I don't think I'd play either of these guys at these numbers, but we have seen in the past, Ryan, coaches this market changes so much late i mean all it takes is a one a win here and a loss by another team or a couple wins and a couple losses by one of the favorites and this market flips on its head so how are you thinking about coach of the year right now 
So, you know, D'Amico Ryans belongs in this race. But like you said before, if C.J. Stratt is in this team's quarterback, I think they're a three or four win team. I think you're spot on with that. How are the Colts seven and five? That's absolutely remarkable to me. And here's the thing. They get Jake's Browning's Bengals this week, Mitch Trubisky's Steelers, Arthur Smith's Falcons, who, you know, we all think so much of him. You, you guys put together a, a song about the guy, talking about how much everyone, you know, <laughs> God. Then you get the Raiders, and then here's the big one here. They play the Texans in Week 18. In so many years, there's, you know, years ago the Browns played the Steelers when uh, Stefanski ended up beating Tomlin in the coach of the year race, where the winner of that game could end up winning this race. I don't really want Steichen at five plus 500, but I do think – if the season ended today, he fits the profile more than anyone else. And I'll, I'll say another one, which I, I actually can't believe I'm going to say this, but Matt LaFleur at plus 2,000 is actually a pretty good bet with their stretch run and the chances that they're going to make the playoffs. So mm -hmm. I, I hate even saying that, but that he should probably be more like 10 to 1, 12 to 1, especially since they just beat the Lions and the Chiefs. When Trevor Lawrence went down, my first thought was like, let me get some Colts futures yeah. in. Because uh, I do think the Colts have at least – a chance to pass the Texans, pass the Jaguars. With Lawrence looking like he's okay, it's probably not as good now, but Steichen would be in the mix there. I don't know if I'd take the five to one. I mean, the the Colts, I think they were like, I think I got plus 550 to win the AFC South, like right as Trevor Lawrence was getting hurt. And by the way, for anybody out there, some of these books, it seems very irresponsible to me, but some of these books leave up these futures markets, odds to win division, uh, odds to make the playoffs, odds to win the AFC while games are going on. I mean, that is that is dangerous, man. Uh, uh, but they do it. So definitely be on the lookout for that. I don't think I'd take the five to one there considering there was plus 550 on them to win the division. But yeah, I think he's certainly in the mix. I do think though, Gary, Dan Campbell probably deserved the award more last year. This year, I think the team is more playing to its level, but some lagging factor, some like lagging indicator on this award where you did a really good job last year. You do a really good job again. And then this is the year that you win it. In other words, D'Amico Ryans did a great job this year. If he does a great job next year, then it'll be D'Amico Ryans year. That's the way I'm kind of thinking about it now, but Lions have to keep winning games. So yeah, what do you think about coach of the year right now, Gary? Yeah, that's a super interesting point. And, you know, as far as Campbell's concerned, like the Lions have not been the same team in the second half of the year that they were in the first half, especially on the defensive side of the ball, right? And like, that's where you expect him to have his, you know, his, his team buttoned up with like the personality that he is. So I, uh, I, I, I get it. I get why he's the favorite. I don't really want to touch any of these guys. So I, Ryan's, if we recall, also going back to that first show, like that was one of my favorite bets to give out. When I don't remember what he was back then, but I really liked Ryan's because I liked the way the Texas team was looking. That was also, though, before CJ Stroud like absolutely ran away with offensive rookie of the year. And that was like mm -hmm. when we were talking HN and there was a bunch of names at the time. I think the only way voters reward the Texans twice is if they win out and win the division or at least win the division. Um, so I think you need that to hit happen for Ryan's also win this award. So I think it's a bad bet right now at less than three to one or three to one as much as I've loved him. Um, Steichen also is the guy that I think is the most intriguing, but you don't have the odds there now either. Um, but yeah, I mean, if they, if he can keep kind of pulling these wins out of his ass, uh, with this team, with Gardner Minshew, I, I do think he, he can pump up, especially with like, as I kind of mentioned, the, the Texans being double rewarded, um, and with, the, and with the Lions maybe not trending totally in the right direction. I do still think this is Campbell's award to lose, but I don't think there's a ton of value in this market right now. I think the LaFleur call was interesting, though, Ryan. Uh, certainly impressed with what the Packers have done um, last three or four weeks. Yeah, for sure. The The way that a long shot wins this is both the Texans and the Lions start to lose games. Lions' schedule is at Bears versus Broncos, at Vikings, at Cowboys, versus Vikings. So not the easiest, but certainly not the toughest either. I think the only other guy that we haven't mentioned that I think is perhaps worth mentioning, keep going back to Tomlin. Last week was such a bad loss for everything Steelers, but he's 30 to one here on DraftKings. I bet he's lower elsewhere. Very winnable game tonight against the Patriots. And then we'll see from there. And then Kevin O'Connell is going to get Justin Jefferson back here. And there's some narrative around, hey, this team lost its starting quarterback. Justin Jefferson was out for seven weeks. If the Vikings somehow get hot down the stretch, maybe O'Connell is still alive. I'm just trying to think of ways that if the Lions lose three out of their last five or something like that, that some long shot gets in. Any thoughts on those guys, Ryan, or anyone else at Coach of the Year? No, I, I agree with Tomlin. He's also the guy who deserves it the most, like legacy-wise. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm, I think I already bet on him once. I may do it again. Because like you said, too, he's going to get a showcase game tonight where they, they could shut out the Patriots. So right. I'm interested in that, too.
All right. Any other coaches you want to mention, Gary, before we get out of here? Oh, we can't get out of here. We have my favorite award, comeback. Sorry. Any other coaches? No, no, no on coaches, but go ahead to come back. Yeah. Oh, God. Well, <laughs> I'm not, I feel like I don't have great tickets in the other markets. I feel like I have incredible tickets in comeback player of the year market. However, Damar Hamlin is not going away. Minus 230 still, despite playing very few snaps this year. Not because he's hurt, not because of what happened last year, because he's just not good enough. Has played very few defensive snaps this year, is still minus 230. I mean, I have no idea what voters are thinking. I know I've said this on this show every time we've done it. I think that what happened to Tua was not as horrible as Damar Hamlin, but was pretty freaking scary, man. Like, pretty scary. And so Tua has come back, stood in the pocket, taken a ton more hits. I mean, he's like the definition of comeback and has been one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. He's he's like the fourth choice for MVP. So to me, it's a no-brainer that it should be Tua, and he is still plus 280. You can probably even get better numbers than that elsewhere. So, Ryan... I don't know, man. I'm ready to like throw my hands up on this Hamlin stuff. I can't believe he's still minus 230. What do you think voters are thinking now on Hamlin? Because that's by far the most important part. I think there are going to be voters that just vote for him because he, he stepped on the field. I think that's going to happen. This question of how many, 20, 30%, I think is probably my expectation. If it swells beyond that, I won't be shocked. But I do. I, I agree with you. I, I think, too, like you said, he, he thought about retiring in the offseason. And, like, and he's in the MVP discussion. So... I think him, I don't think Russell Wilson's done enough. I don't think Lamar Jackson counts. No. Nope. But I will I will say this. If the you know, assuming the Ravens beat the Rams this week, next week when I write the article, we're probably gonna talk about Matthew Stafford. If Matthew Stafford's like seventy five to one with the commanders on deck who literally have the worst pass defense in the league, the Saints who don't want to beat anyone, they they fail every week, and then the Giants. I'm kind of interested in throwing my hat in the ring with him if his odds get out of control, but yeah. otherwise, I, yeah. Well, I, I guess my point on on Stafford is like, how could he? How could you vote for him over Tua, no matter what he does? Tua's true had a better year, and true. Tua had a worse injury, right? So, like, how could you? True. Uh, how how could you vote for Stafford over Tua? That that would make sense to me. Just to follow up here, Gary, uh, Demar Hamlin has played in one game on defense this year. He's played in three games total. But only one of them he got in on defense, nine snaps all year for Damar Hamlin. And again, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, uh, belittle this guy and what he came back from. It's obviously absolutely incredible. But I don't think playing nine snaps all year is enough to win the award. Gary, any thoughts here on comeback? No, and I think anyone listening to this show at this point knows how we feel about the situation. Like we've beaten that caveat into the ground that it's a remarkable what he's done. He doesn't deserve to win the award. I think it's it's really that simple. Now, again, we're trying to get into the minds of these voters. There's definitely going to be enough voters out there that just say, oh, he's on the ballot. We're voting for him. I don't know if it's as many as we think, though. I think there will be some people that try to take this a little bit more seriously. Tua, to me, by far the most deserving. I think you shop for this one. Like I think FanDuel might be 5-1 to one right now, so it's literally yeah. double the odds, basically. Um, so you can get some interesting lines that I still think are worth taking on Tua. Um, uh I would take five to one on Tua right now. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. Um, so, yeah, I, and I, I, I just want to say, like, I, you know, as far as the long shots here, I understand your Stafford thing, Ryan, because I do think again, like, we're just trying to get into the mind of voters. So I'm with you, Adam. Right? He doesn't deserve it over over Tua, basically, no matter what happens the last five weeks. He didn't have his worst injury. He's not going to have better stats. But one guy's what in their late 30s, and one guy's in his early 20s. So I just think that like you could you could see an argument if he goes crazy. People like the guy. Um, you could see that, but I think it's probably a little thin, but I, you know, if you can get a real long odds, I, I do understand that. that take. Yeah. 50 to one on DraftKings right now on Stafford. Wouldn't be enough for me, but I think it's an interesting thought for sure. And yeah, I mean, if you can find even plus three fifty, four to one plus 500 on Tua, I think that's good. I'll just peel back, peel back the curtain for people here. Once the season's over, I will make a tweet about how many snaps Demar Hamlin played this year and what his comeback uh, player of the year prices. And I guarantee there's some voters who will see that and they'll, and they won't even realize that Tamar Hamlin only played nine snaps this year. And my very powerful Twitter will sway them into voting for Tua Tugavailoa. So yes. Um, 
he he does have a very powerful powerful Twitter. He's just that's just not all talk there. <laughs> Dude, how many of these voters 100%. do you think know that Hamlin only played nine snaps this year? I'm serious, like not half of them. Not, yeah, probably. About yeah, half maybe. Of them. Yeah, no. exactly. All right, <laughs> all right. This was fun. I didn't mean to come in here and bag on the voters. I just get so hot and bothered about about comeback player of the year. I'm sorry to everyone out there. Okay, appreciate everyone being here. Ryan's article will be out next week. You'll get his reaction to what happened in Hertz versus Dak and how that affects the MVP race and all the other races going forward. For Gary. For Ryan. Yeah, you know what, Ryan? Tell the people where they can find you. We didn't uh we didn't give you a chance to tell the people where they can find your glorious work. Uh you can find me at Ryan Reynolds NFL on Twitter. Um and I, I do all sorts of stuff at the 33rd team. Just wrote a you know playoff look ahead for fantasy football. Going to do some winter pools and stuff later in the week. All sorts of stuff over there. All right. And Gary, of course, everybody knows Gary at G Hartman 314. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure you check out Gary's first look video for DFS. Getting quite popular, Gary's first look. People love Gary on the first look. All right. For Gary. For Ryan, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.